Welcome to Dental Brain Crops. I'm your host, Chelsea Myers, and today we're joined with Dr. Mark Adelberg. Mark, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me, Chelsea. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. So I have a lot of things on my mind that I want to talk to you about today and things that I think our listeners will find really interesting. But um, but first of all, just tell us a little bit about yourself. You are located in the East Coast and what are you doing? Yes, I am located on the East Coast. I practice pediatric dentistry. We're located in uh, Long Island, New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, presently we have five locations and we have, oh, at this point, I think it's about seven pediatric dentists, three orthodontists, a general dentist, an oral surgeon. I have a team of about 80 people who, uh, who help make this, uh, this village work for us. <laughs> and um, I've been doing this since 1998. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I started my residency in 1996. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're at the point now where it's like, wow, if, if you include dental school, you know, I've been doing something dentistry related for now 30 years. Yeah. So you go back to yeah. 1992 or even before that when I was, you know, an assistant to a dental assistant in the high school days. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's where healthcare, your healthcare journey began then in high school? It did. I was really fortunate. I had a class in high school called the Community Internship Program. Mm-hmm. And they basically said, anybody who wants to do anything, let's set up a class where you'll be, uh, you go on an interview, you will, you know, pretend to take a job, which in theory wasn't pretend. We, we actually did interview for a job. Mm-hmm. They said, what do you want to do? I said, oh, I want to be a dentist. I said, great. Let's, right. let's hook you up with a few dentists in the area that might be looking for somebody. At the time, um, I was an assistant to an assistant, which we now call floaters. Mm-hmm. And uh, day one, I was like, this is so cool. And um, nothing bothered me. Uh, the more, you know, blood and guts and whatever, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And mm-hmm. uh, within a few weeks, the assistant that I was assisting, she had quit. And they're like, do you want a real after school job? And I said, sure, this would be amazing. And in the community internship class, we, we, we wrote a journal and I would come back and I report back to everybody what I thought was really cool and other people thought I was crazy, but uh, <laughs> I thought dentistry was amazing. And so I'm, I will say I was very fortunate that I went through college knowing that I wanted to go to dental school. I did change my major in between, but I did know that that is exactly what I wanted to do, which is really not the case for many people going through college now. And I do know I have a a college senior graduating Mother's Day weekend. And when I speak to him and his friends, they're a little bit, I don't know what we're doing, but I was very fortunate that I was clued in from an early age. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it started like back in high school. So you just raised your hand. You're like, I want to be a dentist. What made you, what led you to that conclusion? Listen, I would love to tell you with some story that (laughs) I... You know, I, I need a new tooth or I had trauma or I, I love braces. I, I honestly, I, I can't tell you what about dentistry made me fall in love with the profession. Mm-hmm. It just seemed like something cool to do. Okay. I like, and, I, and now when I look back over time, I like to tinker. I like working with my hands. I love people. And, I, and now in retrospect, I look back, what dentistry has allowed me to do is to make a difference in people's lives. Mm-hmm. And and as a psych major in college, bio minor, I feel like as a pediatric dentist, we are like the psych people of the dental world. We are yeah. we're really nurturing and, and encouraging children, you know, to to lead happier and healthier lives based upon not even just their teeth, but their their smile, their airway, confidence, etc. We're taking somebody who's really scared and nervous about going to a dentist, and then making them into really happy dental patients. So, and I always like that component of life anyway. I love cognitive psychology. I, I, when I was younger, I was a camp counselor. So they were like, if you start kind of like connecting all the dots, it really makes sense now why I chose this profession. But I can't say exactly why dentistry was the thing that, you know, what about dentistry lured me in? I don't know, but I'm happy I made that decision. Yeah, it's interesting when you, when you put it that way, because there are a lot of things that are much more connected than we realize until we start picking them apart. And we're like, oh, this is actually a puzzle that's been put together. I get it now. So, you know, I, I went to dental school up in Buffalo and they had a children's hospital up there. So I was able to minor at the University of Buffalo in pediatrics. There aren't a lot of dental schools that have minors. They allow for that. So I got a taste of what pediatric dentistry was all about. Wow. And then I took that back down state because I, I'm from you know, the New York City, Long Island area. And I, and I worked in the Bronx for two mm-hmm. years at a residency in Montefiore. And um, that was wonderful. And I had a mentor who had said to me, try to find a residency program in an area that maybe is not as affluent, where the disease process will take you 
a few extra steps yeah. and, and maybe the patient population, you know, isn't as able to afford or maybe doesn't come to care as often. So you're going to see a lot of things. And that was very much true in, in the population that we dealt with. We saw things in people's mouths that you would typically only read about in a textbook or we had definitely, definitely very difficult, challenging families. Some families that, you know, didn't have fathers at all in their life, never knew them. Some families that, you know, were involved in, in gang violence, et cetera. And, and so it was, it was, well, it was very rewarding to help those people for sure. Mm -hmm. But you feel like if you can train in that type of an environment, if you train in a trauma center, et cetera, when you go off to private practice, you've already dealt with so many difficult um, scenarios that it made it much easier to adapt into private practice. Wow, yeah, that sounds like a significant mental investment as well. So on the one hand, you're getting all of the exposure to things like you said that you might only see in a textbook, but then there must be some sort of mind management that has to take place to be able to provide the professional services you want to while managing your emotions about what you're seeing, particularly with smaller people. Well, that's true. And yes, you have to manage your own brain. That is true because the reality is really, really in any part of dentistry, I remember when I was even in dental school, our, our head periodontal instructor used to say to us, you know, when you're probing to see the, the, the depth of the gums, you have to push mm -hmm. and they're like, but the patient says, ow. And like, but you have to figure out what's wrong. And in pediatrics, you know, kids are generally scared of needles. So when we first started and we used to use a lot of needles, which we don't anymore, we, we now do laser dentistry for most of our work, but you have to realize that what you're doing is not hurting somebody, but you're helping somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably nurses and pediatricians, et cetera, who deal with pediatrics, they also know the same thing. If they're doing a throat culture, if they're doing an immunization, Yes, there's a certain component of discomfort, but at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're doing something that's right for the patient. Yeah, that seems like it's also really beneficial to um, communities as a whole, because I had a really bad experience in my early adulthood years. I went to the dentist and he was, we were just not a personality match. He was very fast and rough and I was very timid. And so he actually ended up making the recommendation. He was like, you know, you may be more comfortable being seen by pediatric dentist because, um, <laughs> this is the pace that we typically work at and it usually works for our patients. And he was probably right. So I did go see someone who was, uh, had some, a different skill set um, as far as my timidity and it, it helped me a lot. And now I don't have that fear and, um, all is resolved in that aspect. But I think that it's really interesting. So you had this amazing training experience and then when did you decide or what did you decide from there as you're stepping out into your own professional infancy? That's a great question. So when I was coming out of my residency program, I was looking for places where I could have some sort of ownership. Mm -hmm. And when I first started, I was a part of a group that today we would probably identify as a DSO. Mm -hmm. They weren't really anything like that in, in you know, the, the early part of, of the, you know, the 2000s area. But there was somebody who was buying and selling practices and I was, I was working for them. And I tell people I was kind of like an indentured servant because I signed the contract immediately as a partial owner. Mm -hmm. And then over the next seven years, I was to work for them. And then they would take the average of the last two years and they would sell me a percentage of that back. So that's kind of where I go with the indentured servant. So I gave my time and built up the practice to be what I wanted to be and that I would buy for them. That was section one. And then section two, I was working as an independent contractor in a general dental practice. Mm -hmm. kind of figuring out exactly how I wanted my practices to grow. Now, I will say neither one of those scenarios actually came to fruition all the way because I ended up leaving both because okay. I wanted to start my own practices. So I learned some things from the groups that I was with, some of what I didn't want to do and some of what <laughs> I did want to do. And, and so um, it was four years after I was out that I started my own office and then about two years after that, I started a second one, but I never really worked for a pediatric dental practice ever. Okay. It was always me on my own, kind of putting together and crafting exactly what I wanted at that time, my vision to be. And then that has since evolved over the last, you know, 25 years of private practice. 
course. And so when you're putting that together and thinking of your vision of your pediatric practice, what was it that you knew that was really important to you when you stepped away from those other two roles? Oh, well, when I thought about vision, I just thought about more of the, the aesthetics and mm -hmm. the experience. That's okay. what I thought vision was back then. And mm -hmm. I grew up in a family where my grandparents moved to Orlando in 1973. And so I thought everybody's parents or grandparents lived in Disney World. I, I didn't know how fortunate <laughs> it was that I was going down there every summer. And, and we grew up as Disney junkies. So to me, I was like, your office should look like Disney World and your customer service should be like Disney World. And, and that, which is not, not a bad that's, vision. <laughs> that is not a bad vision at all. Now, as the vision evolved, we started, you know, understanding what core values were and so forth and, and how yeah. I wanted, not only the customer is the patients who walk through the door, but you can also make the argument that the customer are the people who work with you as well, because mm -hmm. you have to also have a certain bar set for your team and to make sure that they're being heard and then you're doing the best you can for them. So, um, but I'm sure all businesses have the same motto. I mean, I, I don't know if Disney treats the people that work for them the same way that they do as the people who walk through their gates. Uh, I mean, it, but there's challenges on both sides, but you know, that's mm -hmm. how everything has evolved over that over time. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when you talked about, you know, there were things you learned initially that you were like, okay, there's things I want to do versus things I definitely don't want for my own practice. I think that, um, I think that that, that's an experience we have everywhere, even, you know, in our own homes, you can look back at your growing up experience and be like, Hey, there's certain things that my parents did that were fantastic. I definitely want to replicate or amplify. And then there's certain things I probably would do different. And I think that both are really enriching, um, data points for us to have as we're building our businesses. So you now have this vision and you've got some really good things going for you. How do you um, communicate that vision to your initial team? How did that play out? My initial team or my team today? Well, your initial team. I just really want to hear the whole thing, like how it developed to what it is today, which by the way, for our listeners, is a pretty amazing deal. So I'm trying to understand right. that story. Well, I will say when I first started, I had, you know, again, I was working out of two general dental practices. So there was yeah. only so much that I could create. But once I knew that I was moving out on my own, there were people in those locations who were like, we really want to go work with you. Oh, we cool. like, you know, yeah. we, we want, we like the way you treat the children. We want to be a part of that, that experience. And so again, I, I just started creating offices where the waiting rooms were amazing that there were bright and vibrant colors. You know, the first office I moved to, I specifically picked a suite right next door to a pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And because I felt like the, there would be so many families walking through the building looking for something in pediatrics. And I told the, the owner of the building, I want my inside door to be completely glass. And yeah. he said, what glass? Why? I mean, we, we do wooden doors. I said, because my waiting room is going to look so amazing that as they walk down to the pediatrician, they're going to stop and go, what's that place over there? So we got a lot of walk through traffic. And so the wow factor is one of our core values now. But back then, I didn't know that that it was exactly what we were shooting for. Mm -hmm. But I always told, you know, people who are on my team, you know, we're going to wow them with that first phone call. We're going to wow them with how our office looks. We have mm -hmm. to wow them with the treatment and then wow them with the walkout experience. And, and so that's something that we were always, again, that, that Disney mentality, customer service has to be paramount. Um, I did not want to become an insurance mill. Um, I did not want to become where all of our treatments going to be dictated by whether an insurance approves or doesn't approve. And so mm -hmm. we have to find value in what we're doing. And when families come to our practices, they might say, I can go to the guy down the street who takes my insurance in full, or I can come over to this office and, and are their friends will say, well, why would you go there? I mean, you, you have to pay out of pocket for certain items. And I just want them to yell from the top of the hills. It is so worth it. Your, your children will love going there. I want to go there. And, and that actually eventually, I mean, I'll skip all over the place, but that evolved into us bringing a general dentist too, because parents would ask us, can you treat me? And they should say, you yeah. know what? The, the only adults I treat in the practices are the people that are called my mom and my dad. <laughs> but but we can get you in now. And so we actually ended up hiring a wonderful general dentist who used to be a high school teacher, 
and so she treated some of her adolescent patients and then which eventually evolved and she treated their their parents as well which would have been perfect for you chelsea because you know what you you want to be in a pediatric office and you have a little bit of nervousness and trepidation so you get all the benefits you know of the of that disney-esque type of atmosphere and the, and the vibrant colors and and uh, and the cool things are on the walls and the TVs that hang over the chairs. I mean, now people put TVs over the chairs all the time. We did that like 20 years ago. And uh -huh. people are like, this is crazy. I'm like, yeah, when you lay back, you should be able to watch the TV and not have to care about what we're doing, you know? And and now it's great because, you know, you can you can log into anything and they want to watch Netflix. They want to watch Hulu. They want to watch Disney Plus. Like put on whatever makes you feel comfortable and we'll get through the visit. That's so fantastic. Yeah, it would have been perfect for me. It's just a little bit, you know, it's a bit of a commute at this point, but <laughs> I'll keep it in mind for sure. But, you know, as you're describing what you've built, you're, uh, I'm feeling myself become, you know, excited about this. And so I'm wondering, you must be attracting a lot more people than are actually the right fit, because in order to keep this environment, that's going to take a lot of, um, you know, the right type of team members. So what is your process for finding, um, and identifying the people that will best fit in and cultivate this culture that you're creating. Well, we now have a team that when they interview people, they interview them based upon our core values. They don't mm -hmm. specifically say things like, hey, do you have integrity, which is our number one core value, yeah. but they will ask them questions that will kind of gauge what their integrity might be like. Mm -hmm. You know, we ask them about customer service. We try to find places where they have worked previously. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, if somebody sends us a resume that they've worked 20 years in the hospital system, mm -hmm. I probably won't interview them. I'm like, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? They got great, they have great experience. I go, I uh -huh. don't know. When I go to the hospital, it's like, you know, I, when you call them, you don't even hear the word, please hold. You hear, please ho, which is not a very nice kind of comment. <laughs> and, then they, and they like, and I'm like, what? Like, I don't, I don't want people like that. I, I want somebody who is like the server or the hostess. At, at with the local restaurant that people love because they understand customer service. Yes. You know, you can't treat, you, you can't train personality. You can't train, you know, wit and engagement and, and fun. You know, I want fun people. Uh -huh. You know, I remember there was a wonderful podcast, how I built this and, and they, they were interviewing the, the CEO for Southwest. And they said, how do you have so many smiley people working for you? And his answer was, I only hire people who smile. So I'm like, so now we could go into a whole different thing about employment right now and what's going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, for and, and a reference point, when people hear this at some point, they'll hear it next week, next month, but they'll, somebody will pull it up a few years from now. You know, we're in 2022, we're coming hopefully out of the end of COVID. Unemployment's kind of a whole different world, but yeah. our goal really is to hire people that, that know our core values and it like oozes from their pores. Mm -hmm. You know, another mm -hmm. core value we have is good enough never is. So I don't ever want somebody to say, and I use this example with my team, you know, if a mom comes in and says, hey, Dr. Mark, you know, how'd the filling go? And I went, ah, it was good enough. Like people are going to be like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what yeah. does that mean? Hey, it should hold up. You, you'll be okay. You know, I think. Right. Oh, and so, no. you know, like, no, and, and nobody would ever accept that. You know, if you're getting on the airplane, right. You say to the flight attendant, like, <laughs> how's the pilot? I think he's good enough. What do you mean good enough? You know, you know, or you know, imagine waking up from surgery. You're like, oh, how this, how the procedure go? I, it's good enough. Yeah, good one. So, like, <laughs> like so, and I, so I think that that should be all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't want people, you know, even in the back who don't even deal with, you know, some of our families that come through. You know, how how are we doing with with billing, with you know, with accounting? You know, where are we with our AR? It should never be. Yeah, it's good enough. Don't 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 ask. It's you know, we really want to know that things are being done well. And it doesn't mean that things have to be done perfect. We understand that there's room for error, especially when people are training. Perfection, I'll, I'll insist on on treatment because there, that there should really be no room for error. But you know, the way our hygienists or our new doctors speak to people, they're gonna have to learn to get better at that. But the way people you know, do the billing or answer phones, I don't expect perfection up front, but we're gonna continue to train, train, train. And you know, what's the, exception, what's the uh, expression? Uh, shoot for the moon and if you miss, you still fall amongst the stars. Like yes. those are the sort of things that, that I expect from my team. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have like a really, so you've developed these practices to the wide range of services that you talked about. And I was noticing that you also provide um, attention for special needs dentistry. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because I think that's a really important and um, unique service that you specialize in. 
Well, we have to. So they're, they're and not, not because, let me rephrase that. We have to because we want to. You know, ch every child needs mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. And just because they have special needs doesn't mean that they shouldn't be treated. They, they really need to be treated. Many of these patients have a lot of challenges. Some mm -hmm. of them are reflected in their mouth. For example, a patient with Down syndrome could be missing teeth or having extra teeth. But some of our patients and a lot who, let's say, are autistic or they're on the spectrum, the parents have a very difficult time brushing for them. Mm -hmm. And if they go to a general dentist, most general dentists don't want to cheat children, period. But once mm -hmm. the child starts to act up in the chair, they're like, oh, no, no, no. For us, we're like, listen, we know it's not all puppy dogs and rainbows. We try to make that experience possible. But we are we have to be there. I mean, that should be probably the number one thing that pediatric residents will declare when they come out of residency program, that every child that requires help, no matter how difficult behavior or their special needs might be, you have to provide that care. And by the way, not all special needs patients have behavior issues either. Right. Their special need could be that they're immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. So you just have to understand that you're speaking to you know, to their, their physicians on what sort of treatment needs to be done. Do they need blood thinners? Do they need something to help clot. Do we have to check, you know, their, their platelets or their white cell counts? You know, um, I actually have a, I have a child with special needs. My, my son was diagnosed with type one diabetes last year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so that is something that, you know, never in my wildest dreams that I think that I would fall into that category, but it certainly helps me to understand parents' mentalities and, and their and their their mindsets and you know how nervous you know for me as a parent I'd be nervous on the other side of my childhood you know what's your blood sugars like are you too high or too low do you realize that mm -hmm. his ability to heal may not be as well as somebody else's so all those things have to be taken into account but I, I, I love helping children with special needs and I really help I really love helping their parents mm -hmm. not with their dental needs but with helping them to know that there are people out there who absolutely will go run through a wall to help their families. And that's just it because I, early on in my professional life, I helped develop some, um, some programs for a special needs um, population. And there's a difference between having knowledge of what that looks like and what the needs are and how they manifest themselves and having that nurturing capability to actually handle and treat those types of patients. And so when you couple your Disney like approach or, you know, um, strong attention to, um, interpersonal relationships with an interest in serving different populations, I feel like that's just a really winning combination. And you're right for the parents, it's just gotta be so rewarding and, um, just almost put you at ease because, you know, these are not only just nice people that have the knowledge they need, but they actually have an interest in helping us. I think that's so great. Correct. And I think when patients or their parents start coming to pediatric dentists, once they finally realize that we are more than willing and, and most of us more than capable of helping you, you can almost like feel, you can see the, the body language that parents yeah. go off. Mm -hmm. And even on, even on younger children, I mean, the first visit really is supposed to take place at one years old, special needs or not. And a lot of parents, well, I don't want to come, you know, what if my child has a bad experience? What if they cry? And I go, well, what if they go to the pediatrician at one years old? They're going to cry. There, there are items that we need to help your children with starting now, and they will become our best patients in the practice going forwards. Mm -hmm. like, really? Like you'll treat a child if, if they're not cooperative? Of course. Mm -hmm. Some of them just need to be helped and, or, or at least learn different ways. There's no one or two year old that's going to be perfect at everything. As a matter of fact, they're going to be imperfect at almost everything. And so mm -hmm. that's okay. We'll, we'll, we work with that. I mean, it, our, you know, expectations are, are different for me than maybe for somebody else. And we have to teach them what ex expectations are realistic. And yeah. we explain to them, you know, your child might sing my, sing my praises at the top of their lungs during the visit. And they go, <laughs> sing your praises. And go, well, that's one way of putting it. They go, yeah, that's okay. It's just a different perspective, right? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you're smiling as you're saying all of this. And so now we see that you've got, you know, multiple practices, a wide range of services that you offer, including to adults and oral surgery and orthodontics, all the things. And I have to just point out and wonder at the same time, like in order to develop a business that grows like this, there has to be also personal development on the founder. So can you talk to me a little bit about um, as a business owner, what do you do? to 
develop yourself so that you can continue to develop your businesses the way that you want to? Well, that's a wonderful question. And, and hopefully uh, this will help um, anybody who's listening who might want to engage in your services as well. I was very fortunate about 20 years ago to be introduced to, you know, a dental coach at that time. And, you know, I will say when I came out of my residency program, I was like every other hot-headed young, you know, dentist, I could do it all. But yeah. my first associate, I hired her for the wrong reasons. Okay. I hired her because, you know, I wanted to take on some things and not others. You know, she could do this. Um, we should be a good fit because, you know, she was a, an associate. She was a, um, a dental resident while I was an attending at the hospital. So I knew her. We knew the same people. We did, you know, root canals and caps the same way. So, of course, this has to be a good match. And as it turns out, it really wasn't. Our, our, our core values, our vision, et cetera, were completely different. Mm -hmm. I may not have identified at that time those particular items. I wouldn't have said the words core values and vision, but where we wanted to practice, how we wanted to practice, the hours that we should be open, um, how you dealt with different types of, of family members or even different types of treatments that we were gonna provide for. It just wasn't the same, which started to lead to a lot of friction and and there was never really conversation about what our future should look like and so that's when i i, have a, I had a friend of mine who introduced me to uh, this gentleman mark cooper who was uh, a retired periodontist who was into coaching and he helped me to learn you know very famous expressions in my life now expectations unfulfilled lead to disappointment is, is one of them so i had expectations that weren't going to work she had expectations but we never really sat down to discuss them and so when it was time for me to bring on another associate, he helped guide me through that process. You know, what do you really think your practice looks like? Can you relay what that looks like to somebody else? Cameron Harold would talk about a vivid vision. Back then, it was just like, let me put some things down on paper and kind of explain to you how I see things happening. Um, do you want to become a partner in the practice? Do you want to live in Long Island long term? And so... You know, I, I have often said when I've you know been on stage at the AAPD or something, I like to use the analogy of imagine going out on your first date with whomever is sitting across the table from you. And you said to that person, you know, do you ever foresee yourself, you know, getting married or having children on date one? Now, the person across the table is probably going to say, this guy's crazy. I mean, I barely know him and he wants to know if, if we want to settle down and have children. Oh. And I would say, no, no, that's not what I'm asking. I'm not asking if you want to get married to me or do you want to have children with me? But if that was something that was very important for me, and it is, like I did want to get married and have children, but you were sitting across the, that restaurant table from somebody who said, I never want to get married. Or yeah, I would love to get married, but I never want to have children. I just want to travel the world. If you already know that on date one, there's no, no reason to go to date two. You're not going to change that person's mindset. So that's how we started approaching that next associate and everybody thereafter. I'm looking for people to help grow the practice with me, not for me. I'm looking for somebody who wants to become a partner eventually. I'm looking for somebody who can see their roots in Long Island and stay here long term. I was looking for somebody who was going to be invested in the practice, not an investor in the practice. And so that's how we started crafting our doctors. And then we started crafting people in our practice. You know, if you look at our full time team members, many of them have been with us for a really long time because they knew exactly what we wanted. They knew they'd be working a few nights every night, you know, till six or seven o'clock. They knew they were going to be working, you know, every other Saturday except in the summers, we get people off on the weekends. They knew what they were getting themselves into. They knew the why. They knew that we wanted to become, you know, the premier dental practice on Long Island that was going to positively impact the child's life forever. We measure our visits really by how many smiles we create. I mean, that's what we count up. Our mission is to make you smile. If you call my practice today, literally right now, if we did like, I'm going to challenge you on this, you would call up and you would hear, hi, thank you for calling Edelberg Moth. How can I make you smile? That's, <laughs> this is exactly what we preach. And so, you know, I don't know, call what you want, cult, whatever, but, but they buy into it. And when you have a happy team, you have happy patients, and then your business will grow. Mm -hmm. 
Well, it sounds like what I see a lot is these conversations you're talking about could be thought of as difficult conversations to have with someone, you know, meeting someone and saying, do you see yourself getting married and having children one day? But it really begins with knowing what exactly you want and having your own vision clear. Because once you do, it removes a high level of the difficulty that seems to be there because now you're just having a conversation. Now you're just getting to know someone. Whereas before it was almost like trying to figure out what you want in the process of trying to build something with other people. And so what I'm hearing you say is that you've got to be, take some time and really focus in and figure out what you want. And if needed, employ, you know, employ people around you, get a coach, get a mentor, talk to somebody, other people who are further down the road so that you can understand what is best for you and what you're trying to build. Correct. Right. And, and by the way, like, you know, when I first started, this was like the internet was in its infantile stages. Like there was no yeah. Google. I know people like now they'll listen to what do you mean there was no Google? There wasn't even Yahoo. Okay. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I, I say that because if you, even if you look at, thank God that I don't, I don't need one, but the, the dating services or whatever, like when you put your information down, I mean, they want to know, you know, if you like somebody who wants to travel, you like somebody who's in business, healthcare, somebody who's athletic, somebody who likes restaurants. Brunettes, blondes. So they figured that out too. I, I mean, I guess I had just figured that a little bit earlier than that, but let's put some filters in place so that you yeah. know exactly what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. And then everyone's happier. Exactly. Absolutely. That's yeah, fantastic. Sure. And so I think that leads perfectly into, I know that you have um, a philosophy about life profit versus business profit that's really important to you and you make sure that it's present in all of your business decisions. And so talk to me a little bit more about that. Oh yeah. So I, I, I love the term life profit. So we all know stories of people who have worked and worked and worked and worked. And it's like, well, when are you going to retire? I don't know, like <laughs> 75, right? And you go, oh, okay. I mean, that, again, if, you, if that's what makes you tick, great. But, yeah. but it, it's like, well, you know, did you, did you see your children grow up? Were you able to, were you able to coach? Did you take vacations? Now for those are things that are important to me for other people, it may not be, but um, you know, I was very fortunate a few years ago where, where, Believe it or not, my original associate, we're still friends, by the way. So even though it didn't work out, you know, she had said to me, like, why are we working every Saturday? Like, and why are we working? Every and so, you know, we should work every other Saturday. And then so that eventually started morphing into, okay, if I worked on a Saturday, then I would take a day off in the middle of the week mm -hmm. or vice versa. If I was not working on the Saturday, then I would work during the week. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking like, well, why, why do I keep making up all this time? I have plenty of people who are working with us. And they can take that time. So what I did about 10 years ago is I moved my day off to Fridays. I didn't need it to be the typical dentist Wednesday off to go play golf. I was like, I'm going to take off on Fridays and I'm only going to work every other Saturday, mm -hmm. which means every other weekend, I'm going to have a three day weekend. And in the summer, we don't work weekends at all. As far as I'm concerned, we don't have to be up on Saturdays. The kids aren't in school. You can get your children to the office during the week. So every weekend, in New York, school ends in June and starts up in September. So basically from like mid-June to mid-September, three-day week, three weekends across the board. Now, mm -hmm. we all know every once in a while when that pops in, Columbus Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend, you know, Labor Day weekend, everybody's like, wow, I got off an extra day. Mm -hmm. I chose to make that part of my life profit years ago so that I could reduce stress. I could do things with my family. I could hit the reset button at least every other weekend, if not every weekend during the summer. And I told the team too, like, I don't want you guys working on Saturdays in the summer. I want you to go out. I want you to enjoy yourself. I want you to go to the beach. I want you to go on mini vacations. We, you need to have that. At the end of the day, to end up with a tremendous amount of business profit, but have no life profit, I don't know. I don't know where that really gets you. It, it's, it's, I think you're lacking on something. And then eventually, you know, you get to that point in life and you go, well, is this really where I wanted to end up? Like, I wish I could have done more. And, and, mm -hmm. and the one thing I learned a long time ago was that the one thing you never get back in life is time. And it's, and it's the most valuable, valuable commodity that we have. I told you, I, I had I'd found a story in this book that I wanted to share with you guys. And I thought it was really wonderful. And, and it, it turns out it's really about um, life profit, right? So the story goes like this. An executive strolls down to the beach and notices a fisherman uh, rowing into shore. His, his boat is chock full of fish and the executive asked him what he's doing. And the fisherman replies, I've been fishing because I love it. And now I'm going to have a barbecue on the beach with my friends. 
I'll play guitar and sing and hang out at the beach. And then in the evening, I'll dine with my wife under the stars, right? So the executive says, well, that's crazy. You've caught so many fish. I can invest in you and we'll sell the fish and make a ton of money. And the fisherman says, well, why would I want to do that? And then, you know, the executive says, well, in a few months, we can make all this money. We'll invest the profits. We'll buy a larger boat and we'll make even more money. And the fisherman says, well, why would I want to do that? And the executive says, well, in a few years, we can invest all those profits and open a factory on the beach and process our own fish and make even more money, says that executive, right? And the fisherman says, well, why do I want to do that? And he goes, well, with all the profits from what you could eventually retire early, and then you can go fishing just because you love it. And then you can have a barbecue <laughs> on the beach with your friends. And you can play guitar and sing and hang out on the beach. And then in the evening, dine with your wife under the stars, right? <laughs> so that guy, the fisherman, he figured out life profit a long uh, time ago, uh huh. right? And I don't know where all you listen. I live in New York, and there's no bigger rat race than New York. And every time I go on vacation somewhere, I think to myself, boy, I mean, everybody likes to talk about, you know, how great New York is. And don't get me wrong. I, I, I feel fortunate to have grown up here. I love the beach. I love New York City. I love all the sports teams and Broadway and museums and the stock markets here. But honestly, like, I don't know. I, I have friends of mine who practice all over the country. And I'm like, yeah, I think maybe practicing in Colorado or North Carolina or Florida or Arizona, et cetera. I think it w we would have been better off. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm Mm -hmm. So wherever you are, I would just say, live your life to the fullest, do fun things, take great vacations, make sure you build into your business model, life profit, as well as the business profit that comes in the P&L. If you don't have life profit in your life P&L, you are going to miss out on the best things that life has to offer. Wow, that is really well said. I I think you should write a book. But <laughs> I don't beyond, like that. <laughs> no, really. But beyond that, I think it can be sometimes just a matter of being intentional. You've talked a lot about being self reflective and um, asking yourself probing questions so that you can make the right decisions. And sometimes it's just stopping or pausing long enough to ask yourself, "Am I enjoying?" the success that I have, because we can become so focused on the next thing or the thing after that, that we forget that right here is absolutely amazing too. Sure. Right. Yeah. Very well said. I will say not, not that I've done this, but I was listening to a podcast recently and, and there was this notion of like somebody wakes up every day and goes, how can I make today just a little bit better than yesterday? I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, that's like, but sometimes you just have to identify, right? Like we, we sometimes live in the gap and not in the game. And we yeah. forget like all the really great things. And when that's like, a, I mean, we all do that, right? You can see 99 patients and the one patient that goes wrong, that's all you focus on. And you forgot mm -hmm. that you help 99 people who really love you. And the one didn't, okay. You know, that's a hard mindset, but that is, I mean, that's actually a wonderful book too, the, the, the gap and the gain. I mean, live more in the gain than the gap. Absolutely. Which is probably Absolutely. all the things that you teach with emotional intelligence. I, I know that's a big thing for you, so. Well, it's kind of like, what if, you know, sometimes I ask myself, like, what if this was the best day of my life? Then what are all the best things in it? Like, what are the components that make it the best day in my life? And it, you can just shift that focus from that one patient that's not happy with your things didn't go well to, well, patient number 97 was fantastic because of this. Number 78, this was a really funny experience. We had, you know, and you, you just tell your brain what to focus on and it actually feels a whole lot better <laughs> than focusing on that one out of 99. So. But that's the way the human brain is designed. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you, I, you know, I think we spoke a little bit about this on our first call. It's like when you really look at the evolution of humans, the ones who are out there who were frivolous and, and, and cavalier and, and kind of did whatever they want and never really, never really honed in on some of the danger signs, they're not really a part of any of our DNA anymore. You know, the two people walking <laughs> through, they are, I mean, they, they perished, right? Two people uh -huh. walking through a, a field and there's a brussel in the bush, right? And one guy goes over there and checks it out and he gets bitten by a snake or a tiger or something. And the other one goes, I've seen this story play out before. I'm going to run up the tree, right? Yeah. The people who were literally scared of their lives, how are they going to make it through? Those are, the, those are the people who have survived, you know, the people who lived in the Wild West who thought, I'm just going to get into a gun battle every time, you know, you bumped into my drinking a beer. Like they're not around anymore. And uh -huh. it's like that. So, so it's okay for us to like focus and harbor a little bit on like what went wrong. It's just a bad mindset to be in, but it is, it is sort of a survival tactic that the human 
race has gone through for 10,000 years to get where we are today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, evolutionarily, that made sense. But now just recognizing that, and I think that's where your self-reflection comes in, recognizing, right. okay, this is what's happening in my mind right now. And I'm going to pivot and respond differently because that's not going to serve me or anybody else. So, yeah. It, it really is true. I, you know, I um, I went out recently to, uh, we had our office retreat at this really amazing um, spa up in Massachusetts. And um, we took a meditation class with this guy named Chill Will. It's literally his name, Chill Will. <laughs> cool. And, and he was the head of meditations. He was asking, you know, what we thought. Uh -huh. and, and I try to meditate here and there, which I think is a really good way to like hit the reset button. But I said to him, I go, listen, Will, or chill, Will. I said, I, here's my problem with meditation. I, I never can stay uber focused the entire time. My mind will automatically drift into something or start replaying this in my head. And he says, Mark, he says, come on. That's the way we are. If you put a movie projector on all of our foreheads and project it onto the wall, what we were thinking, people would all think they were bat, you know what, crazy. And, um, and, and the person, let's say you've been having an argument with, it could be your spouse, it could be a business partner, whatever. They don't even sometimes even know what you're angry about. And you're playing that movie over and over and over in uh -huh. your head. So he said what he uses meditation for and tries to change the mindset. And he says, let's take that movie that's playing and just say to yourself, I'm going to project it on that wall. It doesn't have to be the main feature. Just throw it over there. Let it play out. I've seen that movie already. Mm -hmm. And that movie's crazy. And I don't really know. I didn't like the movie the first time I saw it. And now I've watched that movie like a hundred times. I, just, I didn't like it the first time. I didn't like it a hundred times. Right? Like, I mean, we, we all have movies we flick it through Netflix. I go, hated that one. Click, click it. But there's something yeah. you really love, right? I'll watch Shawshank Redemption every single time like, it comes up uh -huh. on TV. Like, so play the movies that you like and start to focus on the things that make you happy. And that will really change your life. Yeah. And I find writing really useful for that too. If I've got, you know, that movie playing over and over and I'm like, oh, I hate that episode at least. So I, I'll just write it all down on a piece of paper. And sometimes I look at that and I'm like, yeah, that doesn't even make sense to continue entertaining that thought. I'm not going right. to work with that one anymore. Right. You know how many times, right. We've all sat down with one of our friends or our spouse, something we tell them like something that, we're, that you didn't, really didn't like about something like, you know, and they look at you like, <laughs> I know this means something to you, but yeah. You know, like, I, I know, like, sometimes I'm guilty of this, but like, can you just bring the plane in for landing? Like, I don't understand all the details there. <laughs> and it should be like, ah, I go, but it doesn't, like, if, I think if you really sat down and thought about what's happening here, you'd be like, honestly, it's not that big a deal. It's time to move on. Yeah, sometimes even as it's coming out, you're like, I can hear that this isn't making exactly. a whole lot of rational sense. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> 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 Very good. Well, Listen, hey, we, is, we, we have survived every bad day that's ever come our way. Yes, that yeah. is so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there we've all experienced some bad days, bad things, but here we are. And we're laughing and we're having a good time. And, you know, again, your listeners are going to be hearing this. I mean, we're like the face mask or not face mask, you know, should we get our third, fourth, fifth booster? Like, but, but two years ago, we were all like, oh my God, the world is literally coming to an end. And uh, I'll be on an airplane to Dallas uh, next week uh, without a mask, uh, hanging out with friends at the bar. Like that seemed like was never going to happen again. So we've made it through. And by the way, somebody on this other line somebody's gonna pick up oh he's so like non-compassionate i knew somebody died from covid oh believe me oh. i'm in healthcare. i understand it was a serious time my point is though is that we are starting to come out of that like dark tunnel that things are starting to get better and i'm just saying that there's there's always going to be some light yeah, yeah absolutely well thank you so much so self-reflection being really clear taking the time to pause to get clear and then creating what it is that you want and it all just kind of falls in place if you stay in alignment with your with your own vision and I'm, I'm loving the story that you're sharing i love what you're doing and i i'm so excited to see where it goes from here <laughs> me too <laughs> But well, listen, and for everybody who has questions about these sort of things, I mean, this is yeah. what you do. I mean, so, you know, people should call you and, and if they can't self-reflect, then you can help them get to that point. I mean, I, I can't speak highly enough about how wonderful it has been to have a coach in my life. And I know plenty of people, they don't want a coach, they don't want a therapist, not that they're the same thing, but they go, well, why? I go, well, you know what? Like Tiger Woods still has a swing coach and Derek Jeter had a coach, you know, right up to the last day he played and very successful people in life will always ask for help and always try to refine things to make better and try to learn where they're deficient and, and grow in the things that they're doing really well in as well. And it's okay. To, and, and I think it's amazing to have a coach. And so I know that you provide that service for people and uh, I thoroughly encourage people to, to reach out uh, to you uh, and, and, or anybody else in that field and go, help me get to where I need to be. Absolutely. Thank you. And if someone wanted to learn more about you, what you're doing, maybe they're in Long Island and they have, 
kids or they're an adult like me who wants a pediatric <laughs> dentist to help them out, what how what's the best way to connect with you? Well, I mean, we do have a website, you know, edelbergpediatricdental.com. Um, if you want to email me, you can email me personally. You know, it's edelbergdds at gmail.com. That's, you know, um, easy to spell. And I'm sure you'll have it up on the screen so they can, yeah, they can figure yeah. it out. But uh, yeah, I, I'd be more than happy to help somebody who's looking to kind of go on that journey and, and, and they're looking to expand or do better or start their own practice or whatever. It's, these are fun things. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Mark. It was nice talking to you today. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thanks for time. having me. All right.